Vincent and all of you. Um, I'm glad to see that even here at Geek Center, technology is still difficult. I thought it was just me. I mean, when, when Vince called me around July 4th to tell me what I was supposed to say and do this whole week, joke, um, <laughs> we were Skyping, and of course the Skype went out, so then he calls on my cell phone. I mean, I'm all teched up, so that then the cell phone battery died. I mean, it's not fair. And then, so I, you know, I call him on my landline. So I'm really not the right person to be here today. But I'm glad to see that Tom Houston also, and the technology we have here, is also uh, still a challenge. But our real challenges are probably deeper. Technology is just a tool and should not be our master. The problem is we fall too much under the power of these things. Like the intellect's a good tool, but a good servant, but a poor master. We fall too much under its thrall. So I'm going to touch on some of these things today. But it is good to be here and rub shoulders with the Geekarati and try to bring up my <laughs> IQ. I don't know, Buddhists aren't supposed to have an eye, but um, <laughs> I'm waiting for the, I still don't have an iPhone, I'm against it. I'm waiting for the no iPhone, but now that Steve Jobs is gone, I don't know, do we have any other Buddhists running the big companies? I don't, yeah, actually we do. Well, better to be a Buddha than a Buddhist, that's what I say. And I think that's an important part of the questioning I want to um, pursue with you today and also listen and discuss this weekend and ongoing as part of our life here in the postmodern era, in the future, which is now, and how we can be fully here and now and contribute to a better world, as Vincent mentioned we don't want to be fiddling while Rome burns, while the environment burns. And we have been quite improvident in our use. If you listen to Aung San Suu Kyi of Burma's Nobel Prize acceptance speech, the lady Bodhisattva Burma, Aung San Suu Kyi, a real noble, if not enlightened leader, she says, haven't we been improvident in our use of resources today? So technology should be a tool, I believe, and I'm sure we could all agree on that, and not our master. And we also need to consider what is really progress. And is it just charging forward? Is it faster, is better, more is better? And, not just, and also consider ascending and deepening, not just going forward. But first, I'd like to begin and kick off this game, I mean conference, <laughs> with a little guided meditation, a few moments of contemplative sweetness, Take a breath, take a break, let yourself arrive. Don't worry, it won't be too long. It's going to be a kind of instant, one-minute American meditation. <laughs> so meditate as fast as you can. I actually even made some armbands to, uh, to um, reveal this new truth. As Buddhism, you know, truth is always alive and growing. Meditate as fast as you can is my new slogan to try to, try to catch up with you young people. I used to think I had to get out of your way and back you, but now I just have to like, try. I'm trying to catch up. It's, I'm not saying, what's happening anymore? I'm saying, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> so please make yourself comfortable, let yourself arrive. I see that the bodies have arrived here in this room, but has your energy arrived here yet in your body? Collect your scattered energy, and it has your mental energy and your thoughts, your mental energy and consciousness arrived here in your body, on the seat, in this room. And take a breath, breathe deeply, feel it in your lower belly, your hara, your navel chakra. And exhaling and releasing and letting go, letting be. Mm, how sweet it is. Again, inhaling deeply, and exhaling and releasing. Ah. And letting the tension drain away. Feel it viscerally, somatically. Harmonizing, energizing, somaticizing. And again, for the third and last time, now let's really do it. Inhaling deeply and filling up. And exhaling and releasing. Ah. 
And for the fourth and last time, I lied to you. Inhaling and releasing and letting go. The secret of letting go is letting be, friends. Letting go, letting things come and go, letting be. A great acceptance, settling on the spot, on the dot. Just sitting, just breathing, just being awareful. Mindful rather than mindlessly sleepwalking through life. Here are the three points of natural meditation. Natural body, just sitting, relaxed and at ease. Natural breath and energy, just breathing and aware of it. And third, natural heart, mind, just awareing, awareful, pay attention, it pays off. Intention and attention of the essence of wakefulness, of meditation practice. Just sitting, just breathing, just aware, awareing, awareness, aware of awareness. Awareness transparent to itself, nowness awareness, the true Buddha within. Imaho, enjoy the joy of natural meditation. This breath as if the only breath, this moment as if the only moment. Imaho, yes. Just breathe, smile, and relax. Just sitting, just breathing, just being present and attentive. Focus lightly on the breathing if you need a structure to this rather formless, natural meditation. Otherwise, simply aware of awareness itself, incandescently present and lucidly aware, openness and awareness inseparable. Presencing, awareful. Jancho Semcho Krimpoche Makye Panan Kigyoche Gyepa Nyampa Mepaya Kane Kandu Pelwasho May the light of enlightenment be ignited where it has not yet arisen and where it has arisen may it blaze up and illumine the entire universe for the boundless benefit of one and all. And may we all together complete the spiritual journey. And I bow to the Buddha in your seat. Don't overlook her.
I've always enjoyed hearing the term Buddhist geeks, and I love the Buddhist geek work, and I appreciate the great geek, Vincent Horn, and his co-geeks for their great work over these years and helping us all awaken together in this postmodern era and deal more intelligently, skillfully, and also delightedly with technology and use it as a force for the good. In fact, one of my constant themes these days is to use technology to bring the higher back into so-called higher education. So much of this country's higher education is nothing more than mere vocational training. To bring wisdom culture back into higher education. And technology, the new technology and new media can afford an opportunity to do so. I'm sure no one is unaware of great universities now putting their entire curriculum online for free or of the Khan Academy of Zalman Khan with his 3,300 YouTube classes and so on. Why don't we have that for Dharma beyond Buddhism? We could do that. And I throw out this challenge to you, especially you young people with your energy. I really can't think creatively about media, but I can see the possibility. I can see the Tao of Twitter. Where are the haiku that could illumine the Twitterverse instead of these inane little snippets? Haiku can really be a gulp of fresh air, not just a little snippet, a little sip. Haiku, the greatest, the world's shortest traditional verse form, which has been a Zen art form for so many years. Why don't we use it that way? 140 characters is a lot. In fact, one character is enough, sometimes too much. <laughs> the Khan Academy has 3,300 YouTube classes online free. Bill Gates called Zalman Khan the greatest educator and teacher in the world, as far as he can tell. We could take this as an example. Now, how to support and sustain this and all the other issues, and with the collective mind and the resources we have here, there are many who are addressing these issues in the nonprofit and for-profit and academic and technological spheres and creative spheres, no doubt. But what I want to talk about today, for example, is how perhaps we can consider making social media and social networking into spiritual media and spiritual net networking, social media into spiritual media, bring forth the best in each of us and all of us. That's the real meaning of education, to reduce the best in all of us, in each of us, and do this together. It's a shrinking world, as we know. I don't have to belabor this point. But sometimes I'm afraid we're fiddling while Rome is burning. Look what's happening with the environment, with the economics and banking system, with nuclear uh, proliferation and saber rattling, and the other problems that we have in this world. It's not enough just to sit around and meditate and pray. Of course, that's very important. But even the Dalai Lama himself, and if you have seen the Dalai Lama in action, I know most of us have in one way or another, we know he's a junior scientist, like Tom Swift. Oh, I'm dating myself. He's like a junior nerd. I mean, he is a geek. He loves science. But anyway, he says we must become 21st century Buddhists. And he's a monk. He lives like the monks have for 2,600 years. But still, he says, and I've heard him say this in person, and he's saying it again and again, we must become we. I mean, he's talking to the Buddhists, not if you're not a Buddhist, but maybe you become 21st century people. He said, we must become 21st century Buddhists, addressing a big Buddhist audience, including many Buddhist teachers, monks, nuns, etc., from East and West. And what he meant by that, he explained, he said, open to modern education and democracy and technology. This is very radical in the learning centers and monasteries of the East, even now. It's my contention that we're falling behind even the Western centers are falling behind in terms of these modern communication and education systems. And I don't have any answer to this because I'm not very techy myself. Like I was joking, I could hardly 
talk with Vincent across the country. I've been waiting to talk to him today, but th then he doesn't have time for me. He's trying to make the technology work. <laughs> it's just like me. I mean, they're all the same in the end. My friend Mitch Kapoor, the founder of Lotus Computer Company, he's an old meditator. He used to be a TM meditator. He loves these things. One day I was visiting him in his house in San Francisco, and he was so frustrated. He has four or five computers, big, small, medium. He was so frustrated. This is the guy that invented the Lotus spreadsheet. He's one of the original founders, geeks, the original nerds. He said, oh, I just, I'm going to throw this laptop right out the window. And I was so gratified. <laughs> this is how the big boys blow it. <laughs> no wonder why I can't make my kind of teenage dumb phone work. All I can manage to do is send texts to my nieces and nephews. I mean, it's the only way to talk to them. They don't want to be called. They're busy texting. <laughs> I'm much closer now than I ever was to that in the old days by texting. I know what they're doing. They know what I'm doing. It's wonderful. But do we really know what we're doing? Are we not guilty of recklessness and improvidence in regards to the future of humanity? This is Aung San Suu Kyi's question in her Nobel acceptance speech. After being incarcerated in house arrest in Burma for 20 years, after being elected the democratic leader there in the 80s. So I think it's not enough just to sit around and meditate and pray. Of course, as very busy modern Westerners, we are thirsting, we're dying for a spiritual practice, not just spiritual beliefs. Many of us have left the pulpits of origin. We don't need just another moral system. We're looking for meditation, yoga, introspection, self-inquiry, whole living, organic eating and so forth, exercise, healthy outer, inner, and subtlest ways of being for ourselves and each other communally. Relational mindfulness, not just individual mindfulness. This has to be a key word today. Relational mindfulness and beyond mindfulness, just collective awakening. How about co-meditations, doing it together, which is traditional anyway, on so many levels, and not just with human beings, with all kinds of beings and all kinds of levels. The Dalai Lama himself has said, this is a good time for positive social action, not just meditation and prayer. And if you know Eastern teachers, this was not what they were saying 20, 30, 40 years ago when this dharma first started to really proliferate on these shores. There was a great emphasis on monasticism and so on. But now I think integration is the name of the game. We have to integrate the dharma into our lives. I'm looking around the room. I can't see much but I don't see too many ordained monks and nuns here. Therefore, we have to integrate relationships and right livelihood, wise vocation, making a life, not just a living, and so on, into our spiritual awakening, into our collective journey, into our future, which is now and which starts now, always. It's now or never, as always. We have to seize this moment. I love hearing from my younger friends like my goddaughter who just flaked out. She didn't even show up today. She's been waiting all year saying, I can't come to a Buddhist retreat. It's too boring. I'm going to go to the Buddhist geek conference. I said, great, I'll see you there. I just got a text for her. I guess she's here. She's probably got a PowerPoint presentation too that doesn't work. Maybe that's why she didn't come, even though she's a big scientist brain. Life is complex. Integration is the name of the game. Body and soul, heart and mind, alone together. And the social media can be spiritual media in this way. Social networking can be spiritual media. And beyond the word spiritual, whatever that means, really connecting. Let's make every connection meaningful. Let's make every connection meaningful with ourselves, with each other, with every squirrel and dog, not cats, forget cats, dog <laughs> that you meet along the way, cats. <laughs> Just joking. I'm in dogs, my partner's in cats. It's a big issue. <laughs> I think it's very important today to think about whether Buddhism has to be to die in order to be reborn in the modern world. And I'm only, mostly in, you know, talk about here in the West. 
I'm looking here in the front row here in the, the, the Buddhist um, dugout here on deck. I see llamas and, and mamas and all kinds of yamas and, and dhammas and all kinds. Very impressive. They know what I'm talking about. It's like we're trying to squeeze these grand old traditions, like a great, the great white elephant that supposedly gave birth to Buddha into the mouth of an ant here in this world. So complicated, so convoluted. 84,000 Buddha dharmas. Has anybody heard that? It makes me crazy. I'm still looking for that pill. I mean, that one practice <laughs> that can do it for us. And I think I found it. I think it's awareness. Awareness is the alpha and omega, is the higher power of Buddhist dharma. And we all have it. It's impossible to say we don't have it. The question is, what do we do with it? How do we use it? How, where are we? And so forth. Are there tools and techniques we can use, even online? Now, I grew up in the Buddhist retreat system. I've done long retreats. I can see many of you over there have done long retreats. We have retreats in this country. It's great. But also, I've noticed recently that even a Buddhist magazine like Tricycle has online retreats. That's a great initiative. I don't know what it means, but I think it's important to try. <laughs> anyway, maybe we've been retreating too long. Maybe it's time to advance, maybe even attack. <laughs> Raise our angle of attack. Thank you. Because there's, way, there's, too much, there's too much bowing down going down in the Buddhist ghetto. Too much sitting. We need a little more Dharma stand up. I mean, we need to stand up and take our meditation cushions and walk. That's what the Dalai Lama was saying. And actually, he said this to me too, personally, 10 years ago. He said, you know, you, you should be going around to campuses and so on and, and because just leading meditation retreats isn't enough. And I know he's thinking about the condition of this world and also the condition of Buddhism and enlightenment and wisdom in this world. Wisdom, I contend, is the endangered natural resource of our time. Thank you. That's probably my assistant back there, but <laughs> never mind. And we haven't even named it yet, this endangered natural resource. Of course, we're running out of water. There are going to be water wars after the oil wars, as you would well know. Potable water is a huge issue and coming in this world. Of course, we're running out of good air, and we have the, the global warming and climate issues and the tides rising. Of course, but wisdom is the endangered natural resource at these times, and we haven't even named it. We need a Rachel Carson to write a book like Silent Spring, which first brought the ecological movement to bear 50 or 60 years ago. Where is the inconvenient truth film that millions of people could see of the great wise elders of this planet? before they're gone. Now, of course, there will be others. But hear what I'm saying. Even some of the most skeptical, hyper-rational Dharma friends and scholars I know, who are by no means slavish guru followers, surprised me recently by saying, I really wonder if we're going to see the likes of those ancient Himalayan masters again. I really wonder. The immersion and the dedication that they had. I am looking for that myself. I had a good opportunity, a good upbringing, a good formation. Thank, thank God. Thank God for Buddhism. That's what I always say. <laughs> My board members advise me not to, keep, to say that, but that's what board members are for. How can we provide that kind of immersion for ourselves and our young uns and the generations to come or anything like it. So I think that the social media and the new quicker ways of being in touch provide a possibility if we can bring some, some substance, more substance to it as Zalman Khan has with these YouTubes. I still know people who say, ah, why should I do a YouTube? Ask Zalman Khan why you should do a YouTube. Has anybody ever had any trouble with math? He has dozens, he has hundreds 
of short YouTubes about this to help people learn math. Free, on the web. You can call it up right now on your Dick Tracy watch or your iPod, your iPhone. I'm not joking. I mean, if you get bored with my tirade, check it out. He has great stuff, 3,300. I memorized the number, I'm not a numbers man. Free, it's like, it's called the Khan Academy. Where is the Buddha Academy of today? I know we have Naropa Academy today, um, somewhere in the West, I, I can never find it. Oh yeah, it's here in Boulder, I forgot. Because we need to, it's not about bricks and mortar anymore. And we all need to be teachers and learners. And I mean, look around the room, even here in the, in the geek karate, among the geek karate, I see quite a few uh, people getting older. <laughs> None of us is getting any younger. Let's stop just being consumers and start being distributors and producers. And the new media has flattened everything out. We don't need to always go through the central um, authority channels of New York publishing or New York and LA and Atlanta media and so on. Anybody can put something out there and go viral. We all know about grassroots fundraising, helping presidents get elected. In South Korea, a cell phone campaign helped completely turn the election by a cell phone texting campaign. By the way, think about that for the upcoming election. But also, this is just one local election. We have to think globally, but act locally, working on ourselves and each other. Think globally, not just about this election, although I hope you vote. And it's only for four years that we get somebody in power. Also, they're very limited in what they can do with this incredible partisan deadlock we have. So again, we're hurting here. We need another way. This partisan, very two split way of doing things. We need a third way and a fourth way. This is where wisdom and perspicacity, insight and discernment and good judgment comes in. And for that, awareness and awakening and, and mindfulness and, and awakefulness is absolutely indispensable. Plato said the unreflected life is not worth living. I know you think Thoreau said it, but Plato said it. Because this is ancient, timeless wisdom. We can't afford to be so ahistorical as many of us in America have become. Has anybody noticed? Remember what Santayana, the philosopher, said, those who don't learn the lessons from history are doomed to repeat the same mistakes. That's why I think it's very important to think of mindfulness and re-mindfulness, to remember to remember what's important, to remember to remember what we're doing while we're doing it is mindful practice. Not just sitting with our legs crossed and our eyes crossed and our fingers crossed, hoping to get enlightened. <laughs> That's a heavy cross to bear. Remindfulness, remembering to remember what we're doing while we're doing it, and being 100% present and accounted for here and now, in the zone, in the flow. Like Zen art, like haiku, like Zen painting. One slash, a whole bamboo painting, National Treasure of Japan. You don't have time for second thinking when you can act that way, when you can get out of the way, when you can empty yourself so much so that the muse comes through you, when you can... How should I put this? The less of me there is, the more room there is for Buddha, for God, for sacred other, for the sacred we, from I and you to we, the sacred third, the. The less full I, I, of shit I am, uh, full of myself I am, the more room there is for sacred other, for God, for Buddha, however you want to consider it, for, for communion, commingling. Let's try to infuse the new generation with this love of higher education, bringing the best out of ourselves and each other, and use the new media to do it. I contend that there's a, an enormous mine here, gold mine, uranium mine, better than gold and silver, as Bob Marley, as well as the Bible says. Wisdom is better than gold and silver. I heard Barb Marley sing it on the radio last week. I was really happy. But um, I told my partner, and she said, I think I read that in the Bible once. But, you know, who reads that anymore? Wisdom, timeless resource. Ancient traditions, modern wisdom. So many, 
so much truthiness. And on the other hand, such a huge hunger. Don't tell me the young people aren't interested in religion. That's not an interesting comment. They're very interested in finding many of the same things that the other generations did through different ways. There's a huge resource, a huge hunger. The delivery systems are weak. And let me tell you why. Actually, there's somebody here that can analyze this 100 times better than me, Professor David Loy. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. He wrote a wonderful book, which I can't remember the title of. It may have been The Buddhist Philosophy of Lack. I don't know. I'm quite lacking. So, you know, I tried to read that, but I can't remember something like that. And of course, the feeling of never having enough is a big problem. That's why Buddha says that so much of our suffering comes from ignorant craving and desire. Because we don't know what contentment really is or where it lies. But contentment is the ultimate form of wealth. How can we cultivate that? So I think by realizing the wisdom and delivering it, we start to embody it, to grok it, to internalize it, make it our, part of us, ourselves. Learning and receiving and then contemplating and reflecting on it and checking it out and then integrating it and actualizing it in life is actually a wisdom program that we can follow. It's an ancient wisdom program from the ancient Vedas of India, from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. You can see the same things. Learning and taking it in and reflecting and analyzing and checking it out and trying it out and applying it, getting used to it, and then living it, embodying it. It's four steps to wisdom that anybody can learn. This is not Buddhist. It's not religious. It's just wise how we can clear our bodies and minds, hearts and souls, and be more clear about things and where our true contentment, fulfillment, and happiness really lies, collectively as well as individually, transforming ourselves, transforming the world. We're all in the same boat. We all rise and fall, sink or swim together, especially in this incredibly shrinking world where everything is so interconnected, we can't deny it anymore. We can't be isolationists like America 125 years ago, isolationists or, or, or 70, 80 years ago before World War II. We're all in the same boat. We all rise and fall, sink or swim together. I exhort you to consider that and think about that. Buddhism is not just a self-help program. In Buddhism, there's no separate self, and it can't be helped. <laughs> and yet, we do need to grow up and become benches, real people, authentic, decent citizens, menches, not just men, menches. And for that, wisdom, self-realization, Inner illumination is the pearl beyond price, as many have said throughout history. Lao Tzu, in perhaps the wisest book ever written, The Tao Te Ching, and I recommend it to you if you're not familiar with it. Lao Tzu, The Tao Te Ching, of ancient China. Try on the Stephen Mitchell translation. Lao Tzu says, to know the world, to know others is knowledge. To know ourselves is wisdom. This is rich. This is rich stuff. How can we use the new technology more wisely and not just be used by it? Another thing I want to talk about is what this technology does to us. How the average teenager who puts out, and I've, I've read the statistics, um, two or 300 texts a day. Think about that, 10 or 20 an hour or more, 30, if they have a sleep. What that does to your, that's just putting it out, not receiving. What that does to your attention. And why we have so much ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder diagnosed in our country. Six million prescriptions for Ritalin for our school children. The school system in um, Oakland changed the diet to try to deal with this and took out a lot of the pesticides, uh, some of the sugar, and preservatives, and the diagnosis went down 40% just from dietary change at school, regardless of what the kids did at home. What are we doing to our children with the remote control bar and ourselves? The remote control bar, the split screen, the CNN crawl, and all the screens they have opened at once. You know, eating TV dinner with the TV on, with the laptop open, with the iPad, with the iPhone, and so on, all going at the same time, doing their homework. 
fracturing our tension. We're in training ADHD and then suffering from it and giving chemical interventions. Why don't we use attention games, meditation games, to help them increase their attention spans? Like walking one heel to toe on a yellow line on the parking lot or tennis court or a line on the rug or the grass. A typical traditional mindfulness or meditation, walking meditation. And then doing it backwards. And you can do this in a group. Kids like these kind of games. It's a challenge. And then you can do it with your eyes closed. Even more challenging, more fun. Meditation games. We can use the technology for this too. We can use our handhelds and our screens to pass on all kinds of things. How about webitations? Why aren't we meditation teachers in the room with whoever in, uh, our, in the world or our country who's interested in these things every day for free? Meditate with me. I mean, it's no sweat off my back. I love it. It's really, you know, let's get together in a, in a beautiful way. Let's make peace by being peace. How about some webitations, not just podcasts? Now, of course, all of these things have their ups and downsides. The instant technology also leads to a lot of grasping and instant gratification. And people lack the patience to read longer things or to work out and analyze thought processes and so on. I've heard uh, a lot of my professor friends researching and complaining about the learning style of, of teenagers, young and old teenagers today, where they don't really respect, or they don't have interest in learning fields of knowledge. All they want, need to know how to do is Google Google and you shall find, as Buddha said. <laughs> Just facts, not connecting the dots, no principles. Again, ahistorical, not understanding origins and future implications. Just Google it and you get the answer. There's a real loss here in the development of the intellectual muscles, conceptual thinking and understanding. In this over-information age, as I call it, we have so much knowledge and so little understanding, realization, and wisdom. It's really a shame. Wisdom is the endangered natural resource today, and we haven't even named it. Again, there's a great resource. There's a great hunger. The delivery systems are weak. Why? Because there's not a profit motive in it incentivizing those delivery systems. If there was, there'd be a gold rush to wherever that was, just like there was here in Colorado or California for the gold, the silver, the copper, etc. Of course, some people are finding ways to market wisdom or dharma teachings of various kinds, and this has its positive and negative sides, but we live in a commercial society. That's not really a problem. I write books. How many books do you think I could give away? But yet my New York publisher can sell hundreds of thousands of them and distribute them around the world and also get it translated in many languages. So we can use this kind of system, but we have to think systemically. Not just individually, not just the new president for four years, but how about the next decades and generations? Not just one media, because they're all entwined, this transfer of information. How can we recognize the internet as Indra's net, all connected? Every interstice is like a shining jewel reflecting, containing all others. Indra's net, the ancient image of the wholeness, the totality the holographic principle, all in each part, the whole in the part, like the Godhead, the Buddha nature in each of us. The inner light, if you like. We're all surrounded and immersed in media. I think it's worth taking a step back and reflecting on what, how it's affecting us, our attention, our awareness, our expectations, the speed we move at. We have so much faster communication today. Why do we, uh, wherever I go, I feel, I hear people say I don't have enough time to do all that I want to need to do. Anybody hear that? Even out of your own mouth? I've written a whole book about this, Living in Buddha Standard Time, The Holy Now. Where did all the time go? We have all these labor-saving devices. It only takes a couple minutes now to bake a potato with a microwave instead of 40. Not to mention we don't have to gather the firewood and, and, and boil the water. We have all these labor-saving devices, but we feel like we have less time. We have longer lifespans, but we feel like we have less time. And why is that? What are we doing to ourselves? 
We do have all the time in the world. It's up to us how we use it or spend it, abuse it, and lose it. Americans still, on the average, watch three or four hours a day of TV. That's not to mention internet surfing and other forms of media. And yet we feel like we don't have enough time. What are we doing to ourselves, friends, and this world? Being improvident, as Aung San Suu Kyi says, perhaps. Maybe it's a good time to stay stock. This is such a pivotal moment. And we should feel that way. It might not be the first time anybody's ever thought this was a pivotal moment in history. But we should feel that way, especially young people. This is your moment. Seize it. This is it. It's now or never, as always. This is the moment. This is the time. Not to mention the threats that we face now of environmental crisis and so forth and other and nuclear proliferation, et cetera. Even at the level of world hunger, I read that 75,000 children die every day of starvation. In a world where there's more than enough food for everybody, but it's stockpiled, it's not equally distributed, and so on. How can we allow this? Meanwhile, the UN says there's 50 million refugees, homeless refugees, and if you know anything about refugees, it's a terrible situation. Anybody met any of the Vietnamese or Cambodian boat people or the Palestinians or uh, you know, the first people in this country or any other Tibetan refugees? It's a ter- Armenians, it's a terrible situation to be in. But what's going to happen if the seas rise just a few feet? Has anybody looked at the map of all those districts that are going to be underwater? I mean, even the most important one where I grew up, Long Island, underwater. Because the whole thing is flat. It's one foot above sea level. I asked my mother what she thinks about that. And she says, oh, Jeffrey, you read too much. (laughs) She's going to be in Long Island till her dying day. She doesn't care if she's underwater. (laughs) She's going to be buried next to my father underwater. What does she care? But seriously, I think we have an opportunity now, grassroots opportunity, to communicate this way and to awaken together. I noticed that somebody like Ashton Kutcher has, I don't know, six or seven million intentionally followers or fans or whatever they're called now. The Dalai Lama only has, uh, I think, um, 200,000. Can I look this up? I don't know these things. Isn't that a little ass backwards? (laughs) But of course, the Dalai Lama is not out there trying to do that. On the other hand, maybe we who are the Buddhist geeks, and I'll try to you know, ride along in your way, kind of draft along after you with your yellow shirts. Uh, I'd like to think you know, that we can, together, be a little bit of cultural educators and be the wise elders, the enlightened leaders and bodhisattvas, altruistic, compassionate activists that this world so sorely needs that we can be the changes we want to see in the world, as Gandhi said, that we can be the leaders that we long for in the world, not wait for somebody in the White House to do it. It ain't going to happen. The White House is gridlocked between the lobbies and the warring parties and partisanship. How can we think globally and act locally, beginning with ourselves and each other, and make a better world? Not just think about cleaning up the whole environment, but pick up litter, more of a don't litter. How about recycling? How about driving... Cars that eat less carbon fuels. How about buying electric cars? How about uh, all these little things that we can do that definitely add up? And if you don't know what they are, there's a list of 10 of them at the end of the Inconvenient Truth website of Al Gore. If you haven't seen that movie, I recommend it. So I think that it's a very important time for us today to come to some of these conclusions for ourselves and think about what we can do to contribute and to be a light in the world and not a blight. This is very important. And as Buddhist geeks, or just the people of good heart, let's join our heads and our hearts together and put our bodies and minds. And like Allen Ginsberg said, put Allen Ginsberg in one of his poems, he said, I want to put my queer shoulder to the wheel. <laughs> it's great. He's just coming right out, you know. Come out of your meditation closet. Put your queer shoulder to the wheel, please, Buddhist geeks. And lead the way, help show us how to make every connection meaningful and bring the higher back into higher education and into this benighted world. On a per capita basis, 
We lead the world in consumption of resources, production of pollutants, and a profound unwillingness to do anything about it. I mean, just look what's happened to the Kyoto Treaty. We may look upon this year as the one in which climate change really began to wreak havoc, as it's the hottest year in history, and so many of recent years have been the hottest years. And it's a very important year to vote and get educated, be an informed citizen. And again, information is a form of wealth. So use the new media either to educate yourself or to pass on the good word as you see it, please. And let's try to wisen up. Wisdom is the pearl beyond price. And these new technologies can definitely help us to share the wealth. So any questions or anything? I'd like to see a little more interactivity and hear from you. Otherwise, I could just talk all day, which I'm used to. Anything, please. I have a lot more material here, but it's just stuff, you know. We all know what's going on. You know, what doesn't change die, dies. And Buddhism is just now encountering a lot of this modernism and still trying to stuff the elephant into the mouth of the ant and fighting battles of the 60s, like gender equality. When the world is changing exponentially, we're still dragging our he heels and fighting incremental change. This does not bode well for our future as spiritual communities. So it's not just about preservation or innovation. It's about preservation and adaptation innovation. Yes, sir. Um, I had the privilege of listening to a lecture by Geshe Michael Roach, in which he said, everything is a projection of our minds. Now, I'm not sure I really understood him, but I got to ask some questions. And I said, are you saying that I created the Afghan war? And he said, absolutely. And I said, how about the Iraq war? And he said, definitely. I said, how about the sensation of the air conditioner now on my cheek? And he said, yes, you created that too. And I left that sort of confused going, well, screw activism. Maybe I should just train my mind and this solves world peace. And, and I really didn't quite know how to put what he was saying into the context of, of for example, what you're suggesting now. Um, he's being a little bit over-idealistic. You know, there's a whole philosophy of mentalism or idealism, like the mind creates everything. That's not really exactly the Buddhist view. But, you know, you hear things like that, like the mind creates everything or um, everything is subjective or... I don't know. If you bring up Michael Roach, I think we're already in kind of Roachy territory. So <laughs> I don't really want to comment on what he meant. Uh, you could ask... Our Majumika scholars here, Stephen Batchelor, who translated Nagarjuna's journey verses from the center, all about that. And our young Majumika scholar, Lama Elizabeth Mattis Namjel, who's teaching this middle way philosophy and probably understands these things. I don't. I just like to meditate. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he was thinking more of Shakespeare than a Buddha. Didn't, didn't Shakespeare said, there is neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so? I don't know if that's totally Buddhist position, but it might be. I don't know. I passed the buck to those guys in the batter's box in the on-deck circle over there. <laughs> yes, sir. So in what you say, I hear a real call to embrace technology and using social media as spiritual media. And I'm wondering what what you think about the tendency towards disembodiment yes. using technology. So if you're using spiritual media, but you're sitting in front of a computer for eight hours a day. Well, that's a big assumption. Maybe you can have a handheld and you can be, uh, or, you know, I mean, I, I, it's a great question. I, I talk about this too with my own friends and advisors. They say, why don't you just beam out your meditations? I said, okay. But where are the people going to be who are, you know, receiving? Are they going to be sitting at their desk? Are they going to be sitting on a meditation cushion on the floor in front of an altar or a window? Or are they going to be driving and have it on their palm, whatever it's called, you know, their handheld device? I mean, we need to think about the delivery systems and not fool ourselves and turn, as we say in Tibet, turn the god into a demon. 
where you just, uh, my nephew, when he was in college, uh, now he's a radio producer in New York. He was in college at Quinnipiac in communications field. And he said, Uncle Surya, Uncle Surya, I was online for 17 hours yesterday. And I, I, I said, Lonnie, is that good or bad? What are you telling me? <laughs> he thought it was great. It was like he's been studying a lot. I think that's a little excessive, but I don't know. I used to do that too in my own way. You know, at that age and stage, that, that's a good time for really going for it. But yes, we need to be embodied. Did you notice I began the guided meditation with breathing and getting to the lower belly and all? I mean, in short, but there it is. It's very important. And walking meditation mentioned and chanting and all of the different tools and techniques as appropriate, different courses for different horses. Not everybody's a yogi or an exerciser. You know, some are more philosophical, some more devotional, some more prayerful. So this is one's own path, your journey. It's very important that it's authentic and fitting for you, like your own shoes, your own clothes. So I hope we're not encouraging people to be stuck online more and more. The prana, the energy, is exceedingly thin in cyberspace, as a wise early thinker put it. But I do think that these are good dharma gates, and then people can come to FaceTime. Also, there are many people who are shut in, or elders, or you know, junior high school kids, who can't go out and meet people in FaceTime. So they can go out in the virtual world, in the cloud. Yes? They can tune into the most wonderful talks online. I listen. When I want to know what somebody's doing, I look at YouTube. I wanted to know what the Buddhist geeks was doing. When the, the geek meister, Vincent Horn, got on the horn and he asked me to come here. And so I Googled the, the, the um, geek website. I mean, it took me a while to, to figure it out, but I eventually found it. And I saw, holy crap, Martin Batchelor is on there talking about the future of Buddhism. And I clicked on it. It was great. I mean, I know Martine for a coon's age, but she lives in France. She's a, you know, she's a goddamn foreigner. I never see her. <laughs> but all of a sudden, there she was in her full glory, not being stuffed down by her husband, Stephen Batchelor, <laughs> as usual. So I mentioned uh, Zalman Khan's um, YouTube. How about the TED Talks? You're tired by Buddhist goo? Go to the TED Talks. Listen to Jill Bolt Taylor talking about the bolt of lightning that stroked her out. She's come back from a stroke after 17 years of rehab. She's one of the greatest public speakers and spiritual voices in, our, in, in the land. That's right there on the TED Talk for free at 4 in the morning. So some people, they can't go out. You can go out that way. It's a wonderful opportunity. Of course, I'm still a bookworm, and I like to curl up in bed with a book and have a big pile of books, you know, half read, one third read, one quarter read next to my bed. <laughs> so my, my, my partner has it on her iPad. So I carry a whole box. I have to drive on vacation to carry my books and bicycle. She has her, her books and her bicycle in her, in her nook. Yes. Ma'am. Lama Surya Das, am I saying that right? Yes, very good. Is that how one addresses you? Usually people just say Surya, or Sir will do. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. I what's, have... your, what's your name, since we're into this? <laughs> Janet. I have an idea. I'll look for you up a... on Facebook and find out your relational status. You... <laughs> See, you it's very, comes in very handy, you. very handy, these things. <laughs> So I have an idea for a mobile app, meditation yes, app, tell. that I hope someone will pick up and run with. I forgot to mention that, the mindfulness apps and app <laughs> apps and boot apps. What do you this got? This one is simply a matter of putting one's phone in airplane mode for as long as one can stand it. it <laughs> <laughs> in other words, it blackens the screen. There is nothing to do. There is nothing to look at. It will not ring or sound at all. <laughs> Uh, 
Yes, that's we called fasting. That. What I really, what <laughs> people did prescribe that as you know, I, try a media uh, fast, like not listening to the news or the media for a few hours, mm. or go off the grid. Anyway, go on. Mm. I'm noticing that there are, in fact, a lot of delivery systems right now for um, what you're calling webitation. Uh, there's a group called Mind Valley out of the, the Northwest, and they've created a program called Ohm Harmonics. Uh, that encourages their subscribers to meditate and has a program. And then uh, Deepak Chopra's daughter uh, has been pushing on her through her website, uh, Deepak's 21 Day Meditation. It's, it's very easy. That's great. Uh, and free in both cases. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, what I wondered why I'm here is I that I wondered that. if you. But also, would... while I'm listening to you talk about this, yeah. I see in front of me somebody who's just told me his son is in a four year meditation cloistered retreat. Uh -huh. So I also like to give a shout out for you know, people uh -huh. going deep into uh -huh. things, not just many, 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 many sips, uh -huh. but try to drink the whole Hudson River. It, so, seeing it's, as it's good. you brought up this concept of webitation, I wondered if you'd provide some guidelines for what would make a an effective format or style or you know what I'm saying? Yes, because, yes. Because in fact, it's, it's very question. easy to put the stuff out there. Lots of... No, but <laughs> let's talk about quality. When does it actually have quality? No, let's talk about quality, not just quantity. You know, and like quality time, not just how long, but quality, not just quantity. And that's very important. It's a challenge. Um, I was thinking about trying to create some apps, but I'm not good technically, so I talked to the people, this person, that person, they found out, you know, it costs 75,000 or 100,000 to make a good app that goes on this platform and that. But anyway, that's nothing in the bigger scheme of things. Also, you can do it cheaper. But the real question is, what can we accomplish? What are we trying to accomplish? So you just said free, so it's probably not commerce, although there's often commercial motives in the freeware, but it's probably not commerce and th that kind of profit, but in terms of Dharma profit, transformation, mind training, attitude transformation, and so on, spiritual refinement, helping people extend their attention spans, learn to concentrate and focus, all these things, calm and clear the mind, there are different goals, healing could be. Um, we need to look, I think, at the traditional systems the timeless traditions, so we're not just always trying to reinvent the wheel, and also realize that, you know, not, not, maybe we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but there are other ways to travel today, not just wheels. So there may be new ways. There may be. So the people ask the Dalai Lama, can you receive a esoteric tantric initiation over the internet? Usually, this is only given person to person, face to face. And he thought about it for a moment, and he said, absolutely. He said, but it should be in real time, not recorded from another time, because when I'm doing it, you will receive it. I thought that was a very interesting distinction to make. When I'm doing it, you'll receive it, because of the interconnection. You're watching and being there and consciously tuning in, and so is he. And, so I think there are many new ways to do these things. But also, let's look deeper. Look deeper into what we're trying to do and how and why, the motivation and the result, and figure out the delivery systems. That's what I'm arguing for. Thank you. In terms of arguing real for. Time, yeah, quality, real time. Those like there are mindfulness apps now, but they're a little light in their loafers. As yet, but this is new. I'm sure everybody here is aware of Google. The PR president of Google, who's one of the original employees there, who has a Chinese name, it's hard for me to say, but we call him Meng. His card says, Jolly Good Fellow. He's the head of PR for Google, not a small company. He just wrote a wonderful book called Search Inside Yourself. Google and everybody is coming along with these things. But still, let's think about quality and depth and breadth. And not everybody has to handle all the four quadrants. There's depth. I'm oh, sorry. Of course, it's deep that way, too. There's, there's depth and there's breadth. You know, bestsellers like John Kabat-Zinn spread a lot to a lot of people. It's a little thin. And then there's some people that are deep and that only have a few impacted 
enlightened disciples or whatever, but there's four quadrants there. And not all of us can, or every center, or every tradition has to cover all those. Some traditions are more contemplative, some more socially active. And I do think there's a place for this kind of higher education. I'm going to go back to that in the new media, just like television. Who doesn't like to watch some of that great stuff on television? I don't just mean the Olympics, which is cool, like PBS and nature shows and other things. And people used to say, oh, television is going to be the, the bane of our society. And people are going to stop reading. Television brought the Vietnam War into our homes in the 60s and helped end the war. All historians agree on that. A little education about what war is really like and what's happening to those boys that we send over there changed the feeling of the whole country. Education through television news, not documentaries. Yes, sir. So uh, I'd like to poke a little bit at the title of your talk. Go some ahead. More. Uh, I've, I've been feeling for a long time as well that, that this notion that wisdom is sort of one of our great resource scarcities today. And, um, you know, in my case, I found the sort of core insights and practices of Buddhism to be extremely uh, helpful uh, in sort of developing wisdom. Good. And in, in improving, uh, you know, relationships with the world. But uh, I wonder, you know, if, if, if this is to be taken seriously, uh, you know, cultivating wisdom on a grander scale. Um, well, first individually, whether, but yes, collectively. Of course, of course. But like this, this... I'd like to hear more what you think about this notion of Buddhism dying to be reborn, because well, that's just a, provo a provocation to right. think seriously about even the extreme, most threatening notion to all of us: death. Yeah. Well, you know, in, so it, most Buddhists don't want Buddhism to die. Now, I'm not saying that we're all Buddhists. I'm just saying, what do we have to do to revivify the corpse of enlightenment in this culture? Right. Well, I, I, not I sort be of walking feel like zombies, you know. Right, of course. I, I, I just feel like... Uh, Hoping to get enlightened. In many ways. If you sit there long enough. <laughs> without guess, inquiring, for example. <laughs> trying not to think. Hoping to get enlightened. Never happened. Right. Uh, Buddha I do, was a great questioner. <laughs> Go on. Poke. <laughs> so... I, this is I, how I we do it in Brooklyn, by the whether, way. <laughs> when both yeah, I'm, a, I'm a Brooklyn resident when, myself. When we both talk at the same time, there's more communication. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, well, I guess I've, I felt that in some ways one of the impediments to the spread of wisdom is, are, is the tr traditional trappings, the symbologies, the identity right. politics, uh, and the, you know, the stories, the mythology, uh, etc. I think these are all very instructive, but at the same time, right. uh, they it's get culture. in the way of other it's people ex ex right. accepting them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think uh, is the task of a self-espoused Buddhist, uh, given, you know, this fact, like, there seems to be certain tension of retaining uh, the integrity of tradition versus, uh, you know, actually yes. being sensitive to There's what's There's only one to way to do that. I'm going to put it in English. Occupy Buddhism. Yeah. <laughs> Don't leave it to the 1%. Occupy the Dharma, and that also means you become the Dharma. Don't leave it to the Dalai Lama. He, he's hemmed in on all sides. He can't straighten out gender inequality in Buddhism. But here in America, we don't subscribe to the Pope in the old country as much. Half the Buddhist teachers in America, and probably more than half the yoga teachers, are women. So there it is. Yeah, and I it's agree. not a problem. It's, it's, you know, it's just normal. Occupy Buddhism. But, but More deeply, occupy the bar, Dharma, yeah. And, and you have to figure out how. Like, what clothes should you not wear? Just, not just occupy Buddhism, but it's almost like we need to... Occupy wisdom, enlightenment. It's like Buddhism needs to hatch into something else entirely. No, you do. Yeah. <laughs> Buddhism, Shmoodism. Who cares about Buddhism? I didn't go to India looking for Buddhism, and I doubt you came here looking for Buddhism. There's something that we think Buddhism can help us, what should I say, find, get... Realize, let's focus, keep our eye on the ball, friends. Buddhism, Shmoodism. That's why we talk about Dharma often, which means you know, wisdom, enlightenment, transformative spirituality, not just Buddhism. 
and especially in this melting pot culture. People, you know, many Buddhists are doing yoga, therapy, other things, and it, it fits. And yes, for many of us, stripping it down to the bare essentials is the only thing that will fit, not the whole white elephant. Of course, some Buddhologists and some young people want to take it all on, then you should. Sure, go and learn those Asian languages and will be my guest. But you could also do it in English. You could do it in silence. It's not about words. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that you're a reader. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful thing, but uh, reading nonfiction is not this, as good a learning experience as reading fiction. Mm. Uh, novels immerse you in an environment and an experience in a way that nonfiction simply can't. Yes. And I see there is a huge uh, uh, lack in our current literature about spiritual fiction, regarding spiritual fiction. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Um, first of all, I, I'm not sure I, I like what you're saying, and I agree with your spirit, but I wouldn't accept the contention that um, what you first said, that reading nonfiction is somehow better or richer than, uh, reading fiction is better or richer than nonfiction. I said I I'm a reader, better. but I read nonfiction, uh, fiction too. I love fiction. Yeah. I mentioned Shakespeare. But I love fiction. I mentioned haiku. I love fiction. I read junk books. I read all kinds of fiction also. But it doesn't matter what I do. But uh, I think that what you're talking about is creativity and originality and dharma and the arts and other things. Trunk Rinpoche of Boulder has written eloquently about that in his book. I think it's called Dharma Art. And But there are other people from... John Cage and uh, Meredith Monk. Are you familiar with these kind of names? Since you're talking about the arts, and uh, Gary Snyder. And I mean, there's there a book? There's a, an anthology of Buddhist fiction, maybe two or three anthologies of Buddhist fiction. Have you read that? Of short stories by Buddhist fiction writers. Um, there's there's cool Buddhist fiction like the Skullbone Mala novels by somebody I can't remember. Stephen, what's that person's name? That guy. Yeah. There's three or four novels. There's the Bangkok Eight novels. Bangkok Eight. Yeah, Bangkok yeah. Tattoo. Ba you know where the policeman is. Uh, Bangkok is also like his his partner dies and then gets reborn, and his mother runs a whorehouse in Bangkok. But he's the only honest policeman in the whole country, and they call him the Arhat. That's his nickname. You didn't read that? You guys are too serious. <laughs> the only honest detective in the whole country. He's known as the Arhat, which means the saint, you know, for Buddhists in Thailand. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's on very good terms with his mother, who ha who's a madam at the great brothel of Bangkok, and he's like the accountant or something <laughs> to help her out. <laughs> so this is Buddhist fiction. But yes, yes, we all need to, I think, I, well, let me put it a different way. I think that the spiritual life, or spe specifically awareness practice, so-called meditation, et cetera, helps clear out the problem of having so many thoughts that it actually suppresses originality and the empty space for originality and creativity to, to arrive. And I disagree with people who talk about calming and clearing their mind. That's just like a relaxation technique. That suppresses creativity. That's not the only way to meditate. Well, the difficulty I found is trying to find that Buddhist fiction or spiritual fiction that is uh, non-religious. And what are some, and this is, I guess, Those things I mentioned for, are non-religious, but uh, yes, maybe you yes. have to write it. Well, exactly. So I, go what ahead. What I'd like the people in the audience to consider, I guess, is how, as we, how do we, as a community, support spiritual, metaphysical, uh, you know, Buddhist fiction and get it out there so we can find it? What do you look for in the bookstores right now? I don't even know what to call this kind of fiction. Buddhist fiction. Look it up. Google it. It's, no, it's not out there. I've tried. Okay. It's very, very small. Yeah. It's a very sad situation. But here's the good news from the Buddhist point of view. It's all fiction. <laughs> so you can't miss it. That goes back to the first questioner. Maybe that's Michael Roach isn't so bad after all. Who knows? <laughs> I'm alluding to something that's of great concern to Buddhist community. So think about those things. Michael Roach and any kind of cult-like traits that we may indulge in as a community need to be scrutinized and, and self-awared. -aware,
Yes. Um, back to poking at your topic. Um, I've heard it said that the Buddha was not Buddhist. Of course not. He was Jewish like Jesus. Right. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Ask any Buddhist teacher. They all end, have, end with Berg or Steen. <laughs> Go so, on. So um, I'm in a good mood. Is that uh, Rocky Mountain High? <laughs> I'm, I'm from uh, Long Island, so I'm very accustomed to the conversational style. <laughs> so I guess what ca came to my mind is, did we need to have Buddhism be born? And does it need to be reborn? I can throw those questions out. Do we need to, did it need to be born? You mean like historically? Is that I think part of your question I'm asking you? Is that what you're saying? Did it need to be born historically? Yes. Well, uh, it absolutely yeah, needed to be born historically yeah. because was, it was. That wasn't the question. Okay. No, the question was, what is the value of it? That's a great question. You started out early in your talk uh, and you said it's not so important to be a Buddhist as to be a Buddha. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to be talking about re rebirthing the Buddha. That's what we're talking about. Occupy Buddhism, be the Buddha, become enlightened and pass it on, and you, you know, universal enlightenment, not just individual. Look into your own identity and see if there's even a you separate from your neighbor to be reborn as Buddha. How can you be peaceful Buddha and just sit there in the backyard with your big belly? If your neighbor is miserable, if the neighbor's kids are um, you know, severely in trouble for various reasons, and if the whole neighborhood is aflame, how can you just rest on your enlightened laurels? So yes, I think that not just Buddhism, global spirituality has to be uh, revivified. Let's not talk about reborn. Reinvigorated, revitalized. And trans, you know, tr we need transformative spirituality, not just joining and belonging. Not just joining and belonging. And more proactive, that's why I say occupy Dharma. Become Dharma. Don't just leave it to that 1%. Yes, any other questions or anything before we have the last rites? We're almost done with time. So, yes, sir. Um, with the advances in neuroscience that are happening and our new understanding of the brain, it's, there's been a lot of work that's done around detecting meditative brain states. Right? Yes. And characterizing uh, the state of meditation or of, of enlightenment almost as being right. just a, a brain state. Yes. So if we can imagine that there's a... Nothing new about that. Go ahead. Do you, think, do you think that if there was a device, which is, say, like a... You know, everyone has one in their pocket. You put it on, it tells you when you're enlightened and when you're not. <laughs> right? Yes. Is that going to be damaging I'm to, all for it. Is that going to be... That's a good thing, you think? And no. No? That's too simplistic. But uh, do you think that uh, a device like that could help people, like, do the... Like basically, you can think of it like training wheels for the brain, right? So you could sh give people the feeling of sure experiencing that. Yes. Okay. Simulators give you a good training to operate the machinery and so-called real. So yes, but it's not that simple, especially with subtle things like enlightenment or you know God realization or contentment. It's very hard to just entrain contentment. Artificially, of course, you can have some simulator of it, and you know there's a there there, and then you have more incentive to actually live there, not just visit there. Do you think that there's and this new neurodharma is very useful and interesting in that way? But it's not, you know, just new because Buddhist meditators are doing that. Um, Time or Newsweek had on the cover something about the God gene 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, people have been saying, you know, people have visions just because of some biochemical, you know, it's a very interesting field. It's a very rich and mysterious field. And it's hard to really um, rock it all, but it's very interesting. Great. If you're scientifically minded, then neuroscience is just about the, the, the hottest cutting edge of science today. It's fantastic. And with the new fMRIs, and there's even a new thing. What's it called, Adam? After the, the functional fMRI, there's the new one, the FLAC or something. Yeah. It's fantastic. That can light up, show how your brain is active, and so you could get immediate feedback and entrain different states of mind. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a founder of a company, a co-founder of a company that does EEG-based stuff. So we use the uh, yeah. electrical energy of the brain to detect that. And so we're yeah. actually, one of our, my areas of interest anyway, is using that to detect the 
meditative brain states and to help people develop those kinds of applications. Yes. So, I mean, my concern is that there's a, that you can lose the, I don't know, you can, by, you can incentivize med meditation, but then you lose meditation, right? It's fundamentally a goalless activity. And so if you introduce points, right, you give people meditation points, then you could break the, the magic of it. That's right? fine. Yeah. But maybe you're thinking, overthinking it too. Since you have a company, that's your job. But I'm just saying, from the point of practice and experience, that's a, maybe a little extra mentation going on. Yeah. Okay. You know, goalless and effortless is just one more idea. It's like it's hard to try hard to relax. It becomes a contradiction in terms. You have yeah. to learn how to relax, and then you relax and shut up. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Because I'm giving the opening keynote, and we have some, a lot of other interesting things going on, I just want to mention one other thing, which is in my presentation here, uh, specifically about whether, you know, as people have asked whether Buddhism has to be reborn to do its job to, to function well, to, to serve us today. And, and Vince the Geek um, communicated this to me, but of course he didn't give me any details. He just threw out this tantalizing model of the change, philosophers of change have called the four horizons. I call it the four waves, the images of a house. These old traditions are like a house or a mansion, and there are many people, especially in the old world, that want to keep the house as it is. It's a beautiful house, let's put it on the historic record, and nobody can build it or change the footprint, or if they do improve it, it has to look like the other houses. You know, we have this in New England, where people are supposed to look like the New England houses of old. You probably have that in different places here. So keep the tradition the way it was. It's beautiful, and it's always worked, and why not now? And then there's the second horizon or wave, where people are more interested in improving the house, but keeping the same house. So we see a lot of adapters in the world, but they're not necessarily total rebuilders or innovators. A lot of adapters and imitators. And as things progress from just the preservative model, most conservative, orthodox, to other sort of reforms. And then we, the third wave or horizon is those who really want to change the house completely, but it's still based in the same footprint, and it's still a house, and it has rooms. You know, like I was saying before, maybe we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can find other ways of locomotion also today. So they, they want to change and improve Buddhism a lot, but it's still Buddhism. And then there are other people who, as you know, if you know contractors and builders, they'll say, take down that goddamn old house. It's easy to build a good new one as you need it to be. You with me? Many builders say that. Forget about that white elephant. It's too of a house. It's too hard to renovate. Let's just take it down and build what we need. So there are some who say, let's just start Buddhism from scratch. And I say, go ahead. Occupy the Dharma. They don't even call it Buddhism. Enlighten up. Whatever you want to call it. Good luck. And we can see them all represented here and certainly in the multiverse of the many Buddhisms in this country and in the world. And it's all part of it. And there always will be the conservators and the lunatic fringes and the roll your owns and the revisionists and the apologists. And that's exciting. That's a living tradition. And, but again, Buddhism, Shmoodism, is that really what we care about? Better be a Buddha, be awake, be enlightened, be, be love, than, than study loveology. <laughs> yes, last question. Uh, you may have just answered my uh, question. We, we've got a tradition that's like a hub and spoke where one individual carries the wisdom and then radiates it outward. And then we've got a culture that's highly networked that's, that's more like a, a web where the wisdom is held collectively. Yes. How do we integrate those without... Just throwing either one of them. I think that's a great question, and maybe that's a good theme for our conference to consider from the different angles. Because, yes, thank you. Buddha never called his teaching Buddhism. Uh, he called it the middle way. I think that's 
perhaps his greatest teaching, and that relates to what was just asked, and that's my thought. Not too tight, not too loose, not too much, and not too little, and also moderation, in moderation. Thank you.